time the Morrison government recognised that. Thank you, Senator Lyons. It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission (ASIC) has advised that the ASIC Act 2001 prohibits a credit or debit card being sent to another person. I quote ASIC's advice that a person must not send another person a credit or debit card. What does this prohibition mean for the Morrison government's proposed rollout of the cashless debit card in the Northern Territory? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and uh, I thank Senator McCarthy for her question. Um, well, um, I actually um, would like to, to uh, advise the senator um, that um, the, the premise of which she's based her question about um, the cashless debit card being contrary to section 12DL of the ASIC Act uh, 2021 um, is, actually, um, is, is, is not actually correct. Um, the power actually is a protection to prevent financial institutions um, from signing people up to products um, such as you know, credit cards with pre-approved limits uh, without first obtaining their approval. So um, just as when you know, social security payments are made by another means you know, via cheque, um, it's clear that directing someone's social security payment— order. Senator to Rustin, not the Senator Wong, on a point of order? Um, a point of order, but actually I'm seeking leave to table the letter from ASIC, which might assist the minister in answering this question yes. because— uh, it doesn't appear that her answer is consistent with the is, advice that's is received leave and received. Is leave granted? No. I'll call Senator Rustin to continue. And so I understand that it will be considered not at the moment. Senator Rustin to continue, or have you concluded your answer? Um, no, well, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. So, um, just to, to, to finish off in, uh, this particular um, question is that uh, it's clear that directing someone's social security payment to the cashless debit card does not fall under the provision which uh, Senator McCarthy referred to, and that is why in 2016. Uh, that ASIC provided the government with a no action letter for the purposes of the cashless debit card trial. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given many communities do not have Centrelink services and the nearest towns are hundreds of kilometres away, what will happen to people who don't have a cashless debit card? Will they simply have no money, no food, and no way of getting it? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McCarthy for her follow-up question. Um, as Senator McCarthy would be um, well aware, what we are proposing to do um, with the uh, rollout of the, um, the cashless debit card into the Northern Territory in Cape York is, I suppose, the, the best description of it is to, to give the people who are currently on the basics card a technology upgrade. At the moment, um, we believe that it's probably around 16,000 places where the basics card is able to be operated in Australia. The cashless debit card works in nearly one million outlets um, and basically is able to be operated in any premise that has an FPOS machine. So um, the, the inference of your question um, is completely misplaced uh, in the sense of the only thing that this um, legislation seeks to do is to provide um, recipient or people who are currently on the basics card the added utility and functionality of being able to use a card that's universally recognised. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Uh, Mr President, I do seek leave again to see if we can table the letter from ASIC, uh, which refutes all of what the minister is saying. Um, leave is granted. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. The coalition government has been proposing the rollout of the cashless debit card across the whole of the Northern Territory for 18 months. How is it that the Morrison government has failed to properly consider that fundamental elements of Mr Morrison's proposals are prohibited by legislation according to this letter from ASIC? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I will beg to differ with the, um, the, the interpretation that is being made um, in the question as to what the, the letter um, says, according to my advice. But, however, um, 
I, I have the letter now and, uh, and I will refer to it uh, in the future. But I just wanted to make it very, very clear that what we are seeking to do with the legislation to which the senator refers is to enable people who are currently on the basics card, and I've got to say it's a really well-known card, it's pretty basic. Um, it is also very obvious for people who are on the basics card that that's what they're on. The new technology that works in every outlet that has an FPOS machine um, will be completely and utterly neutral in its appearance. People can use the card without anybody knowing that, that the type of card it is. Uh, and, and in fact, um, we are currently in discussions with the traditional credit union in the Northern Territory um, to make sure that we can assist those people in the Northern Territory who wish to bank with their own credit union to use that as the issuer as well. Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Senator Watt, restrain yourself. Uh, Minister, in the wake of a year of unprecedented challenges, how has the Morrison government taken action to support small business through the COVID-19 pandemic to keep their doors open and to keep their employees in jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Rennick for the question. And Mr President, to say that 2020 has been a challenging year for small and family business is an understatement. Uh, they are the lifeblood, as we know, of our communities. Uh, every single day, their hard work and dedication now sees over six million Australians go to work in a job, and they contribute around $418 billion to our national economy. COVID-19, though, has had a profound impact on them. In the wake of COVID-19, many, many, many small and family businesses have faced unprecedented challenges. Government mandated shutdowns because we needed to protect the health of Australians has meant that many small businesses around Australia have faced disrupted supply chains and unimaginable, unimaginable trading restrictions when they were told that because of the decision that we had to implement to protect the health of Australians, they would need to close their doors when we shut down parts of the Australian economy. The disruption, of course, was no fault, was no fault in relation to the 3.5 million small and family businesses around Australia. But, Mr President, the Morrison government, we moved decisively and we moved quickly to put in place historic levels of economic support to help those small and family businesses get through COVID-19. And as we know, our JobKeeper payment that has provided those small and family businesses what was needed to keep their employees on their books. Around 3.6 million Australians, they maintain that connection with their employer. The cash flow boost, it has now supported more than 800,000 employing small and medium businesses with $32 billion in terms of a cash flow injection. And of course, our supporting apprentices wage subsidy has now delivered over $741 million and is keeping around 104,500 apprentices on the job in training Order. where we Senator need them cash. to be. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any examples of how the programs and supports the Morrison government have implemented have supported small business to rebuild, recover and play a key role in Australia's economic comeback? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I can give you the example from Senator Rennick's home state of Queensland. Uh, it is a gentleman by the name of Paul, an electrical small business owner and operator in Toowoomba. As a result of COVID-19, Paul, like so many others, was looking to downsize his business. But when the government announced the JobKeeper policy, that gave Paul the incentive and the optimism to invest in his business. The wage subsidy gave him the cash flow that he needed to take on two new apprentices, Mr President, and he utilised the expanded and now extended instant SF write-off, and he was able to invest in a new ute to support his work. So when COVID-19 hit, Paul was looking to downsize. But with the support of government policy, he not only was able to invest in his business and buy that new ute, he was also able to utilise the wage subsidy and he has now brought on two new apprentices. That's what the government is all about, backing small and family Order. businesses. Senator Cash. Senator Rennick, final supplementary question. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's Go Local First campaign is working to support small and family businesses, including over the Christmas and New Year period. 
Senator Cash. And, and Mr President, certainly as the Minister for Small and Family Business, my message to all Australians this Christmas in the lead up to it as we go into the new year in 2021 is to go local first. The Go Local First campaign, this is all about raising that awareness across Australia to actually spend with our local small and family businesses. Why? Because when you shop locally in Australia, you support a local community, you support a family, you support a local sporting club. I am pleased to acknowledge that many senators and MPs across all sides of politics are, are proudly supporting the Go Local First campaign. And in terms of the lead up to Christmas, uh, if we do have that ability to go out there and to purchase something, just remember. It might be something small to you, but to that small and family business who has been doing it tough, it means a lot to them. And so my message to all Australians is support our small and family businesses and go local first. Senator Stirl. Yes, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On Monday in question time, the Prime Minister refused to guarantee that no worker would be worse off as a result of his industrial relations changes. Can the minister confirm no worker will be worse off? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Stirl for his question. And indeed, uh, our ambition is to ensure that Australian workers on the whole are better off and, in fact, that there are more Australian workers as a result of the types of reforms that our government seeks to bring forward. Because that is the crucial part of the challenge we face at present coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, that we make sure that we get more Australians into jobs once again. The recovery has begun, the comeback has begun, but it has a way to go, Senator Mr President. Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr President, the question wasn't about whether workers on the whole would be better off. The question was about whether every worker would be better off or whether no worker would be worse off. To be directly relevant to this question, I've allowed you to restate the question, Senator Watt. I will listen very carefully to the minister. And to be directly relevant to this question, an answer that was strictly defined by discussion of the, the bills that were introduced that were the subject of this, I'll listen carefully. I can't instruct him how to answer a question. I heard interjections asking for a one-word answer. That is not appropriate for me to attempt to instruct an answer of the question. But I'll listen very carefully to the minister continuing. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Now, in the height of the pandemic, our government sought to bring together unions and employers to engage in discussions around workplace relations legislation in a spirit of cooperation, not conflict. And I thank all of those parties who came together. Our government is grateful for the cooperation that has been shown during the pandemic, for the engagement through those processes, even though getting universal agreement to every issue, of course, proved immensely challenging. We welcome the fact that parties order. came Senator, together. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. Uh, the minister has had over a minute and a uh, point of order on relevance. He was asked to confirm whether or not, can he confirm no worker will be worse off? Like the prime minister, he is avoiding the question, which is telling in itself, Senator, telling in itself. But I would ask him to return to the question. To be. I'm listening to the minister. He, he was turning to the legislation or the bills, or the topic, the direct topic. I, I cannot instruct him to answer a question in specific terms. If, however, he is defined, he's narrowly speaking about this particular piece of legisl proposed legislation, then I do consider that directly relevant because the question is about that particular piece of legislation. Obviously, without foreshadowing something on the notice paper, um, but I call Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. So our approach and our spirit in this has been to try to achieve cooperation as to how reform can best be achieved to get the most number of Australians into employment and into jobs. Those opposite clearly already want to choose the path of conflict. We have chosen the path of cooperation. In relation to the better off overall test, in relation to the better off overall Order. test, the same two tests, Order. the same two tests that currently apply will continue Senator Watt, to apply. On a point of order? On relevance, this is the fourth time we have asked the minister to confirm that no worker will be worse off. It's a pretty simple question. Senator Watt, the minister was actually talking about tests contained in 
the announcement at that point. I, I do consider that to be directly relevant, um, even if it's not in the terms the opposition would like. There's an opportunity after question time to debate the answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. As I was saying, in relation to the better off overall test, the same two terms that the, that the opposition put in place when they were in government will apply in the future in terms of the majority of employees needing to agree and, of course, the independent umpire, the Fair Work Commission, signing off on Order, any Senator EAs. Senator Birmingham. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, I have a very precise supplementary. Thank you. Minister Birmingham. Why is the Prime Minister refusing to guarantee that no worker will be worse off? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our government has very clearly outlined our ambitions in relation to this reform. The Senator comes in here and asks about a guarantee. Well, the guarantee that we give is that every policy we are pursuing is about getting more Australians into jobs once more. That's the guarantee that we are pursuing. We went to the last election proudly during the preceding six years, having seen, having seen one and a half million additional Australians gain the opportunity, the dignity, the value of employment. That job creation record was unparalleled in Australian history. COVID-19 has hit that, but we have seen a comeback of more than 600,000 jobs to date. And our intention Order. is to pursue the types of policies Order. that Senator will get Watt. more Australians back into jobs again into the future. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. At a time when almost one million Australians are unemployed, 1.4 million Australians are underemployed, and for Australians with jobs, wages growth is at record lows. Why is the Prime Minister being dishonest about the impact of these changes, which will cut take-home pay and leave workers behind. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. I had some hope through the first few parts of Senator Stirl's supplementary there that he had Senator been Watt. listening and that perhaps he did recognise did recognise the point the government was making, which is that these reforms, the COVID recovery industrial relations package, coming on top of our budget measures and all of our other support measures are all about getting more Australians back into jobs, are all Order. about ensuring that employers have the confidence to employ, that employers have the confidence to invest and create more jobs. We've been pleased to see the rate of jobs growth over recent months. Order. It is crucially Senator important Watt. we see that rate of jobs growth continue, that we get more Australians back to the position that we were in prior to the pandemic by getting them into work, by getting them into jobs and by creating those jobs through having the strongest possible economy, the strongest possible investment environment Order, and Senator indeed Watt. the most effective workplace relations systems possible built through Order, collaboration Senator and discussion between Order, parties. Senator, Senator Watt, learn to count to 10 slowly again. Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. A fire has been burning on the World Heritage Site on Fraser Island, Gurry, since October 14. That's eight weeks, destroying some 80,000 hectares, 60 per cent of the island, and killing the wildlife who call it home. What has the Prime Minister done to provide support to help save this precious forest, biodiversity and the animals that live there? Or, Minister, is it a case that he doesn't hold a hose so it doesn't matter to him? Senator, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, that's just a cheap and pathetic question coming from the Australian Greens, a cheap and pathetic question that tries to score a cheap political point in the face of something that is actually very serious, that is actually very serious. I'm not, I'm not Senator even. Wong. Senator, Wong, Senator Wong, I'm sure. Senator Wong, I'm sure that's where the supplementary questions will go. But that wasn't even the nature of this question. Senator that Wong. That wasn't even the nature of this question, Senator, Senator Wong. Wong. That wasn't Senator even the nature Wong, of this please. question. Senator Birmingham. Now, we've got the cheap political points coming from there and from there and all over the place, Mr. President. Mr President, in relation to, in relation to the fire on Fraser Order. Island, the Category B, Order, Senator Wong. Category B Senator assistance. Birmingham, please resume your seat. 
I can barely hear Senator Birmingham's answer. Uh, Senator Wong, when you're injecting to that degree across the table, I think it, it interjecting. Sorry, it's been a long year. Interjecting, um, I think it's a bit much to expect a minister to not respond in a disorderly way to a disorderly interjection. But there were lots of interjections across the table. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. In relation to the Fraser Island fire, government has declared Category B uh, emergency in that regard. That results in various assistance being available uh, for states and territories under the agreed uh, formulation of assistance and work in conjunction with states and territories. I gather the Queensland officials have also identified the difficulties in relation uh, to that fire, uh, the particular difficulties in terms of accessing the difficult terrain uh, and the limitations that they have in that regard. Of course, the Commonwealth stands ready to assist, work and cooperate uh, with the Queensland Government where we have the resources or ability to do so. It's why the action has been taken in terms of making the declaration already uh, and we will respond to any further requests that come from the Queensland Government as swiftly as we can. Senator Hanson-Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This is the fourth World Heritage Area in Australia to experience the catastrophic destruction because of climate fuelled fires in the past two years. Why has the government done nothing to stop climate change and to protect these globally significant sites? And what are you doing to take scientific advice to act now before it's gone for good? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, what we have done in relation to climate change is, as a country, as a country, businesses, farmers, Australians, leading the world in many areas in terms of emissions reductions. That's what we've done and what we continue to do. As a country, we have delivered 13 per cent reduction in our emissions between 2005 and 2018, compared with 8 per cent reduction in Japan or 1 per cent reduction in New Zealand or 10 per cent reduction in the US. We've led in all of those cases. As a people, as a per capita contribution, it's by far and away much greater than that, Mr President. Our reductions over that period of time equate to 29 per cent on a per capita basis. That exceeds Germany at 16 per cent, Japan at 7 per cent, Canada at 13 per cent. So as a people, Australians have made contributions in reducing emissions far, far greater than the rest of the world and in doing so have met and exceeded Order, our Senator Birmingham. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Order. The World Heritage Committee warned the Environment Minister over a year ago that climate change was a threat to Fraser Island. The minister failed to act, and now the island is ablaze. Where is she? Where is she hiding? And will the Prime Minister get her to work? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, again, it's the type of cheap headline grabbing stunts that you would expect from the Greens. Uh, no doubt to be sliced and diced for a social media video on which they can grandstand, uh, taking cheap shots, ignoring the facts or the evidence, uh, ignoring, of course, the efforts that are being made that I was just referencing in relation uh, to climate, climate and emissions reduction. They ignore all of those things just so that they can grandstand. They ignore, of course, the fact that climate change is a global challenge, that Australia doing our bit in meeting and exceeding on the commitments that we make, but it also necessitates other countries to do more, to actually reduce their emissions to the same types of degree as Australia has. They're the types of things that we will continue to work internationally to engage in while investing record sums in terms of the technology roadmap and transformation necessary at home, as well as helping to build adaptation and resilience Order, in crucial areas like Fraser Island. Time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrison government's support for female-led start-ups across the country and how this will help build a stronger economy following the COVID-19 pandemic? 
The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question. Uh, just this week, Mr. President, uh, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, uh, Minister Karen Andrews, and I have announced the first 51 grant recipients uh, in the Boosting Female Founders Initiative. Yeah. These are grants which are going to help some of our best and brightest women uh, launch their ideas for the future. The initiative supports these women entrepreneurs to grow their businesses and ultimately to create jobs for all Australians. We do know that female-founded startups do face additional challenges in getting the finance that they need to establish themselves and to grow as businesses. Through the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement, we've invested over $35 million in the Boosting Female Founders Initiative. That will provide grants of between $25,000 and $480,000 to 282 startups that are majority owned and led by women. It will also provide tailored mentorship and advice to up to 4,300 women entrepreneurs. Mr President, the businesses are very diverse. They include businesses like Champion Life Education, uh, a health education technology company uh, which facilitates the development of lifelong he healthy habits in young people. It includes the award-winning Wool Cool Australia, which is uh, an, an innovative, sustainable packaging business that uses Australian wool for its products. It includes a really interesting New South Wales business uh, based in The Hunter, run by uh, a, the owner and operator is Sheree Johnson, an Aboriginal arts and education consultant who works on Aboriginal cultural capacity training on cultural workshops, uh, amongst other things. Mr. President. So, Amongst the 51 uh, grant recipients, there's an extraordinary diversity of activity, there's an extraordinary diversity of businesses, and it's because, Mr. President, we believe in private sector-led economic growth as well Order. as in boosting, boosting Payne, women's workforce. Senator Payne, Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate of the government's initiatives to help skilled women across regional Australia get back into the workforce or stay employed? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I know that, uh, being from uh, Tasmania, the, um, the senator will be very interested in this particular question, Mr. President. Even if some opposite are not, this government is committed to boosting the confidence of rural and regional women in returning to paid work, as well as in supporting businesses to retain skilled women workers. The Minister for Employment, Skills and Small and Family Business, Senator Cash, and I recently announced the second intake of regional businesses that will benefit from the Career Revive pilot initiative. Under this initiative, Mr. President, business owners receive expert advice on how to improve their business practices and policies in order to remove the barriers that exist to women's workforce participation. It does help them to develop tailored options, tailored action plans, I should say, to attract and retain skilled women. And through this measure, regional businesses will be able to attract more women back to work after they've had an extended career break. It will help strengthen regional business, boost women's employment in regional areas and rebuild Order. our Senator national Payne. economy. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister also advise what the government is doing to support women and girls across the Indo-Pacific region, particularly with respect to peace and security? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. This year we have, uh, with Samoa, co-hosted two Pacific women-led virtual meetings, over 30 women from more than 18 different countries, to discuss our responses to the issues challenging the region during the pandemic, a really important opportunity for those views to be heard. And I hope to host a further meeting before the end of the year. With the United Nations, we're also supporting local women's networks and peace builders to address gender-based violence, to reduce isolation and exclusion. In the Solomon Islands, for example, we've supported increased involvement of women leaders in vital provincial roles helping with disaster management. We also know that the risk that COVID-19 poses uh, to women's health and safety, as well as on their economic empowerment, leadership and resilience. This is a central priority of our very, very important partnerships for recovery strategy, including in our individual country programs in the Indo-Pacific. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that under Mr Morrison's industrial relations changes, employers will be able to cut the wages and conditions of their employees? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. 
Uh, in the terms in which Senator Watt comes in and presents that, I certainly cannot confirm that's the case. What I can confirm, Mr President, is very much that the reforms we're putting in place are about getting more Australians back into work, yeah. building on the strong jobs growth that we have had in recent months and ensuring that continues into the future. In getting more Australians back into work, the different pillars of our COVID economic recovery are built upon ensuring that we have the strongest possible economy. We have that economy through the budget incentives to drive further investment, through the support for Australian households and families by bringing forward the tax cuts that will benefit those families and put more money back into their pockets to be able to invest as they see fit. Through the types of measures in skills reform, in the job maker program that we have made sure we are outlining and implementing to give every possible incentive for people to be work ready and for employers to particularly invest in employing young Australians. And we build upon those reforms, we build upon those reforms, Mr President, by ensuring that we have industrial relations and workplace relations systems that offer the capacity for employers to employ with confidence, that offer greater certainty for employees, for example, casual employees, in terms of their rights and their opportunities to convert into permanency of employment, uh, that indeed maintain the better off overall test under a framework where changes require the approval of a majority of employees, changes require the approval of the independent umpire, that we have these frameworks in place and the scare campaign those opposite are seeking to start is just a sign of their desperation and desire Order, to pursue Senator conflict Birmingham. unnecessary. Time for the answers expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. A very specific question to the minister. Will it be possible for every worker at a workplace to be worse off because of Mr Morrison's industrial relations changes? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Australians will be better off as a result of there being more Australians in work. Australians will be better off as a result of every employer in the country having greater confidence order. to Senator invest. Birmingham. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Mr President, you'll note that that was a very specific question, and it was about whether every worker at a workplace will be worse off, not about workers generally, not about anything else. Um, workers at a specific workplace. Thank you, Senator Watt. I've allowed you to restate the question. Again, I, I come to the test of direct relevance, which is a narrower one than broad relevance that was in place until several years ago. In my view, to be directly relevant to such a specific question, the answer must refer to this particular aspect of the package of legislation. Now, that th I don't necessarily, that shouldn't be taken as instructing a minister to answer in the terms that the opposition seeks, but um, I do think that a specific question of this nature requires an answer about this aspect of the policy in question. Um, but again, I say that doesn't have to accept the nature or the terms in which the question is asked. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Now, as I said in relation to the primary question and in relation to earlier questions on this matter today, the better off overall test remains under the reforms the that our government is proposing. And under that test, under that test, the majority of employees need to endorse a change. The majority of employees. So when the Senator comes in here and asks a question about what happens to every employee, well the test is remaining that the majority of employees need to agree to the changes. It can't be any clearer than that for the Senator, but that's not the only safeguard because the Independent Fair Work Commission needs to agree as well, Mr President. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I know the Senator doesn't want to answer this, but I ask again, can he give a guarantee that under Mr Morrison's industrial relations changes, no worker will be worse off? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, we do keep coming back to the same desire for the opposition Order. to narrow a complex area of reform. Mr President, our intention Order. is to make sure that Australian workers are better off, all Australian workers are better off, by virtue of there being more jobs for Australian workers. 
the more jobs there are for Australian Order. workers, the more confidence Order. every Senator Australian Birmingham. worker should I've have. I've got Senator Watt on his feet. Order. Uh, Senator Watt is on his feet. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. I could not have made the question more specific, Mr. President. It's very simple. Can the minister guarantee that no worker will be worse off? Um, and Senator Watt, I think, with respect, when the minister is talking about part of it, like the better, I don't hate, I hasten not to get into the language of it, but the, the boot tests and aspects like that, I do think that is directly relevant. Um, because that is the part that addresses the specific question, but not in the terms you seek. You can debate that afterwards. And I think the minister on that, this question and the previous one when I mentioned that did turn to that specific nature and was directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. So the fact is, Mr. President, that every Australian is better off when we have a stronger economy. Every Australian is Order. better off when we have more jobs being Order. created. Every Australian will have more job Senator security Watt. when there are more job opportunities across the Australian economy. Every Australian will be better off in terms of the services that can be provided, in terms of the potential for wages growth, Order. when we have the highest possible rates of employment in this country. That's what we are seeking to do right across Order. all of our economic Senator reforms. Birmingham. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing Order. the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. The Australian forestry industry is the ultimate renewable industry, growing raw materials that make the fibre-based products we use each and every day. The industry contributes 6.6 per cent to the nation's manufacturing output. Can the minister outline the economic benefits the forestry industry delivers to regional communities and what the Liberal and National Government is doing to support our world-class forestry industry, particularly as we work to recover from COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger Australia? Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Mackenzie, for her question and her absolute long-standing interest in all agriculture, but particularly our amazing forests in Australia. And I know, growing up in a regional town in Victoria, um, Senator Mackenzie knows firsthand how tremendously important our forestry sector is to our regional communities. And Senator Mackenzie, forests and trees are the ultimate renewable resource. Um, they grow. Um, and can I also acknowledge um, Senator Dunningham as the Assistant Minister for Forestry um, for his extraordinary work and passion in making sure that this industry continues to have the potential to grow, to support the Australian economy, but most particularly to support our regional communities. You know, whether that be in Inville, whether it be in Tuba, it might be in Portland, it might be in the southeast of the state where I come from, Bunbury over in Western Australia. Our timber and forestry industries are absolutely a vital part of our economy and a vital part of our uh, regional area. But these timbers, they are sustainable. They're sustainably managed and they are provider of a massive amount of employment across Australia, particularly for those people that are employed in regional areas. 52,000 Australians take home pay as a result of working directly in our timber industry. And in Senator McKenzie's home state of Victoria, more than 15,000 people are directly employed in this particular industry, uh, which is worth more than $23 billion a year to the Australian economy. Um, we acknowledged last year that the, uh, the industry was heavily impacted by the season's bushfires, um, and this has obviously been compounded recently by the impact of COVID uh, and recent export disruptions. So that's why we have worked with the industry, and, and I acknowledge AFPA and the, and the industry, um, to provide $65 million to target support to the industry Order, going forward. Senator Rustin. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Absolutely, Mr President. Thank you, Minister. Great news. Can you outline the significant environmental benefits that are delivered through sustainable forestry operations in Australia and how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting the industry to continue to deliver these benefits to the environment globally? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Senator McKenzie, absolutely this government supports the sustainable development and expansion of sustainable uh, plantation forests across Australia. Um, every year, 70 million new trees are planted, um, and these forests they capture carbon, they grow jobs, and they provide the timber that Australia needs 
as well as an export opportunity for this country. And we're absolutely delivering on our election commitment for the forestry sector uh, by making it easier for plantations and farm forestry projects to generate carbon credit through the $2 billion Climate Solutions Fund. And this will drive $4 billion worth of investment in emissions reduction projects in Australia. So we're reducing red tape for projects located in our five regional forestry hubs, so it will make it easier for the private sector to invest in new Australian forestry products, create jobs and reduce emissions at the same time. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. I'd just like to recognise the chair of AFPA, Greg McCormack, and all the forestry workers that have been in. Uh, Sally McManus hasn't been the only one talking to real workers today in Parliament House. Can the minister outline the risks to the future growth of our world-class sustainable forestry industry and how the Liberal and Nationals government are working to mitigate and overcome these risks? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I too acknowledge the chair of AFPRA uh, and say how much I miss not being your minister anymore. Um, but the Morrison government, as I said, is absolutely committed to the long-term sustainable management and conservation of our forests, and that's why we have sought to extend all our regional forestry agreements so that we can make sure that we have the best mechanism in place to balance the environmental and economic and social demands of the communities and the Australian economy to make sure that our forestry sector can play the role that we know it can play in the Australian economic uh, future, but also making sure, once again, that we create those jobs, because it is about creating jobs and supporting our regional communities. So um, RFAs are a modern way of be us being able to manage our forests through increased transparency and making sure that we are focused on reporting outcomes and making sure that we continually review the management of our forests so that we can get the best out of our forests and Order. maintain Senator sustainability. Rustin. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the report of Aotearoa, New Zealand's Royal Commission of Inquiry into the Terrorist Attack on Christchurch Masjid was released. This report makes for highly disturbing reading. It details how an Australian man was radicalized and came to commit this horrific terrorist attack. It makes clear that the terrorist who murdered 51 people began forming his extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology in this country from a young age, including through engaging with online far-right groups based in Australia. While the report focuses on New Zealand, there are lessons in it for the way Australia approaches terrorism, security, online extremism, and racial and religious hatred. Has the Prime Minister read the report, and how does the government intend to respond to it? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question uh, on, of course, the very serious issue of the New Zealand Royal Commission of Inquiry into the terrorist attacks on the Christchurch mosques. Uh, the government is obviously uh, aware of the report into the attacks and that it has been made public. It is a lengthy report with 44 recommendations contained within it. Uh, our understanding is that the New Zealand government has either agreed or agreed in principle as part of its interim response to the report. The New Zealand government has committed that it will deliver a final response to the report in the new year following consultation with members of the New Zealand community. Uh, our government has a strong partnership with New Zealand when it comes to countering terrorism, all forms of terrorism, including through our joint membership of the Australia-New Zealand Counter-Terrorism Committee. I give the Senator, indeed all Senators and the Australian public, the commitment uh, that our government will examine the report thoroughly, all 44 of its recommendations thoroughly, the final response of the New Zealand government to the report thoroughly, and will engage with the New Zealand government on how it is implementing the recommendations of the report and consider any and all implications for the operation of our own counter-terrorism policies and practices. Yeah. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, the report details the man's associations with various Australian far-right groups and his donations to extremist media organisations, which have regularly been given platforms and crossed over into mainstream politics and media in Australia. Some of these groups have targeted my office and planned to disrupt events hosted by me. Is the government concerned about the normalisation 
of far-right politics in Australia. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, let me be very clear. Our government condemns terrorism in all of its forms, in all of its forms, has no tolerance for such behaviour and, of course, has no tolerance for any form of terrorism, right-wing, extremist or otherwise. Government and law enforcement agencies are committed to addressing such forms of terrorism. This year, I am advised that extreme right-wing individuals comprised between 30 and 40 per cent of ASIO's priority counter-terrorism investigative subjects. Our agencies take these issues seriously, regardless of the ideology that may be the motivating factor or otherwise. Australia's counter-terrorism legislative framework is agnostic towards ideology. As with all forms of terrorism, we continue to pursue investigative activities, disruptions and prosecutions and invite the cooperation Order. of all Senator Australians Birmingham. to assist Time in doing so. Answers expired. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, several of the recommendations of the report relate to properly criminalising hate speech and tracking hate crimes. The report acknowledges a link between hate crime and terrorism. In Australia, our hate speech laws are very narrow and we do not track hate crimes at the national level. Will the government change the law to stamp out hate speech and start tracking hate crimes properly? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, as I indicated in response to the primary question, we will work very closely, both with the New Zealand government yes. in relation to understanding all aspects of the report and all aspects of the actions and implementation arrangements that New Zealand takes in relation to this report. In doing so, we will be thorough in terms of our assessment. Order, Senator, Senator Faruqi. Sorry, I was passing. Point of order is to relevance, um, President. I asked a very specific question about hate speech laws, and will the government actually change the laws to stamp out hate speech? Um, the, the question contained. A a preamble to that specific part at the end, Senator Faruqi. Um, I'll listen carefully, but I believe the minister was being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thank, thanks, Mr. President. Well, indeed, Senator Faruqi, from my recollection, your question asked about recommendations in the report that went to matters of hate speech and associated laws and regulations. So when I say uh, that we will examine the report carefully, that we will work with New Zealand, that we will seek to understand the action that they take in relation to implementation of recommendations uh, and, of course, we will assess all of that against ensuring we have the strongest possible preventions, protections and disruptions available to ensure Order. all forms Senator of terrorism Birmingham. are Time prevented so much inspired. as possible. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Schools, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Why is the minister pushing a plan to allow people to qualify for some trades with no on-the-job training? Wow. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, and in response to the question, uh, the premise of the question is false. Uh, that is not what is occurring. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The National Centre for Vocational Education Research released a report last week that showed on-the-job training was critical to helping Australians get work. So why is the Morrison government doing the opposite? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, perhaps you uh, did not listen to or understand uh, my answer to your primary question. Order. The answer to your question, the premise of your question is false. Um, and I know who you've been talking to, so that's fine. That's not a problem at all. Um, the government has no plans. Let me confirm. Order. No plans Order. to ban. Please resume your seat, please, Senator Cash. I must say, if I had to pick a voice in the chamber, I would, ha would not have trouble hearing it. Would be Senator Cash. There is way too much noise. I meant that as a compliment, Senator Cash. But if I can't hear Senator Cash, there is way too much noise in this chamber. Senator Cash, please continue. Uh, thank you. The government, despite what you have been told, has no plans to ban on the job training. And in fact, we believe, in fact, we are firmly of the belief that workplace requirements 
are a critical part of developing the skill set required and an important element of competency-based training in Australia. Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. So given the government has presided over $3 billion in cuts from TAFE and the loss of 140,000 Australian apprentices, isn't dropping on the job training just the latest example of the Morrison government leaving Australian apprentices like Isabel from Temco and John from INCAT, who are in the gallery up here today, behind? Senator Cash. Uh, well, the answer to your question is no. And again, what I'd say to both Isabel and John, I understand uh, they met with my office today. I was unable to meet with them, but I congratulate Order. them on the work they are undertaking. Uh, the premise of the question Order. is false. Uh, the government has no plans to ban on-the-job training. And in fact, as I've already stated, we value workplace requirements and we believe they are critical um, to developing skills and they are an important part of competency-based training in Australia. Uh, but more broadly, you've actually asked Ms Quill's question. Thank you. That is fantastic. What has the Prime Minister said? Vocational education and skills. They are at the forefront of our economic recovery from COVID-19. That is why, that is why the government is investing this year alone almost $7 billion, colleagues, almost $7 billion in vocational education and training. That is why we have put in place the supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. That Order. is why we Senator have put in Cass, place time the, for the apprentices. Has expired. Thank you, Senator Cash. Time for the answer. Please resume your seat, Senator Cash. Please resume your seat. I, please, uh, no, sorry, Senator Cash. I was calling the minister to resume their seat, and um, I was, I've been ignored much more while I've been calling for order generally across the chamber. But ministers should actually resume their seat when I say time has concluded. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister provide an update on the benefits of our involvement in the global F-35 program to Australia and Australian industry? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I sincerely thank Senator Hughes for that question. Sometimes in this job you have uh, challenging days and sometimes you just have simply great days. And today is certainly a great day. The Global F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Program is delivering the most capable and best value fifth generation multi-role fighter to meet Australia's uh, air power needs. The JSS introduction into service is progressing well. In fact, I'm delighted to say it is progressing very well. Of the 72 aircraft are being acquired, 30 are already in service in Australia and we have three more on the way. This capability will be the backbone of Air Force's future air combat operations. This important program is now also delivering unprecedented economic opportunities for businesses right across our nation. Opportunities that Australian companies and Australian workers are seizing. This morning, I announced that Australian companies have signed contracts worth an astonishing $2.7 billion under the Global Joint Strike Fighter Program. Over 50 Australian companies have participated in the program to date, and it is expected to support around 5,000 that's 5,000 Australian jobs by 2023 Order. alone. Australian-made parts are now installed on every single joint strike fighter globally. That is 600 aircraft so far and counting. Whenever a joint strike fighter takes to the sky anywhere around the world, it does so relying on Australian know-how. This has not just happened. This is a very deliberate part of the Morrison government's plan to strengthen Australian sovereign defence industry. We have created the opportunities for Australian companies to contribute to a large global program for many decades to come. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the Morriston government is strengthening Australia's air combat capabilities to build a stronger and safer Australia? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. The Morrison government is investing more than $270 billion to deliver a more potent, agile and capable Australian Defence Force. This includes $65 billion over the next decade to deliver next-generation 
potent air capabilities. This includes improved weapons systems with longer range and also, importantly, greater survivability. Combining new and existing aircraft with remotely piloted and autonomous systems will also provide increased lethality and survivability. Our collaboration with Boeing on the Loyal Wingman is a prime example. This is the first military aircraft to be designed and built in Australia in more than 50 years. These investments are ensuring that Air Force will continue to have the technologically advanced strike and air combat capability it requires, which are increasingly being built and supported right here in Australia by Order. Australians. Senator Reynolds. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the benefits to workers in the Hunter region of the Morrison government's investment in an advanced air combat capability as part of the economic comeback from COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And it's real, I'm really sorry that those opposite are not really paying attention because this is Australian jobs, Australian industry for the long term. This morning, Minister Price and I announced a wonderful example of how our Australian defence industry, supported by this government, is creating more jobs for Australian workers and supporting our comeback from COVID-19. BAE Systems recently hired 25 former Jetstar employees following the closure of Jetstar's aircraft maintenance facility near Newcastle. These highly skilled recruits have commenced training to help sustain Australia's growing fleet of joint strike fighters and Hawk lead-in fighter aircraft. And I was so happy to meet two of them this morning, Ben and Colin. These technical workers have been retained in the hunter aviation industry and, with help, and they're now helping Defence build its sovereign sustainment capability as our fleet continues to grow. Order. Senator Reynolds, time has expired. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Securities, uh, Senator Ruxton. Uh, yesterday on Sky News, Senator Canavan uh, said about the cashless debit card, and I quote, I think it's now time we take the evidence on board and roll it out across the country. Does this reflect the Morrison government's position? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr President, and I, and I thank Senator Dodson for his question. Um, Senator Dodson, you would be aware, as we are all aware, we are currently in debate on a bill that is before uh, this parliament that seeks to um, deal with existing trial sites and also um, income management recipients in the Northern Territory and Cape York. Nowhere contained in that bill, nowhere contained in that bill, um, is there any intention for any new communities or any new participants to be added to the cashless debit card or income management across Australia? So, uh, so, Minister, uh, Senator, I, I can uh, I can assure you that the bill that is before you uh, at the moment uh, in this place uh, is a, a absolute reflection of the existing policy of this government in relation to income management. Uh, and in relation to uh, the cashless debit card. Um, but it, uh, it does give me the opportunity, and I'm sure I'm going to have many more opportunities before this day is out, um, to put on the record that the cashless debit card um, has a, is, is a superior piece of technology um, that allows people who are um, on the card to be able to go about their, their daily lives, unlike those people on the basics card, uh, and use this piece of technology in the same way as anybody else um, sitting in this chamber would be using a credit card or a debit card that is currently in their wallets. And uh, can I acknowledge the extraordinary work of um, Senator O'Sullivan and the team of people that he's been working with over recent months to make sure that that technology is developed in such a way as the user experience for people that are on the card is, uh, is absolutely seamless and appears no different and acts no differently than any other card that would be uh, that you or I would have in in our wallet. And I acknowledge that we uh, we will continue to work to make sure that we provide the very best technology to support Australians Order. who need Senator our help. Senator Rustin, Senator Dodson, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, in February this year, Minister, the, uh, you said that the cashless debit card. Uh, the reason we haven't done it in the major cities is because. Uh, we need a deal. We need to deal with the technological issues, and you've just said you've fixed all of that up, which we are now close to resolving. It does need to have a broader application. Is also what you said. 
Can the minister confirm that the government's policy of making cashless debit card permanent in the current trial sites and the Northern Territory is just the first stage Order. of Senator the national Dodson, roundup? Time for the question has expired. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dodson, for your question. And uh, no, I can't confirm that because that is not the case. Um, but Senator Dodson, one of the very important things about um, this, the, the changes that we're proposing at the moment, um, is to make sure that we do have use technology to provide assistance to Australians to make sure that they have the very best opportunity to be able to. Uh, to use this card in a way that you and I um, use uh, the cards that are in, in our wallet, including some of the technological advances that Senator O'Sullivan has been working with um, you know, by putting the card on your phone, as an example, so that you're able to swipe it. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned uh, in my prior, uh, question that I was asked by Senator McCarthy, we're also working with the traditional credit union in the Northern Territory so that we can uh, get a very good understanding um, as part of them becoming, hopefully, the issuer of the card going forward um, for people in the Northern Territory who will be on the cashless debit card. So, um, Order, Senator, Senator Rustin. Senator Dodson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Prime Minister said that the cashless debit card is, and I quote, commending itself for wider application. Can the minister give an ironclad guarantee that the cashless debit card will never ever be expanded? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, um, and thanks, Senator Dodson, for his question. Um, you know, clearly, Senator Dodson has not heard what I have said in the, my primary question. That is that the policy of this government is reflected in the bill that is before this chamber um, as, we, uh, as we stand here now. But you know, we need to be really careful that we actually tell the truth and put the facts on the record when we discuss this card. Uh, and there are many, many uh, misconceptions and mis uh, that, that are spread around about this card. And another one was actually was tried to be perpetrated in this place a few minutes ago uh, with a question from uh, Senator McCarthy. And I've now had the opportunity to read the ASIC letter that has been sent to Mr Stephen Jones, MP, the Shadow Assistant Treasurer, and I'll just read you a line out of that letter. However, Section 12DL does not prohibit the unsolicited issue of the debit card or a deposit account to which the debit card is linked. I think that categorically states the answer. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Order. 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 Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Rustin uh, to questions asked uh, uh, by myself, Order. Senator. Um, Senator McCarthy, please resume your seat. Senators, order. Please, um, Senator McCarthy has got the right to be heard in silence. Senator thank you, Th thank you uh, Madam Deputy President. And I, I pick up on the minister's response. And clearly, clearly, and this, is, this has been the problem uh, with the government. It's about pick and choosing, pick and choosing the things that work for you in the sloppiness of how this government has brought forward the CDC legislation. You've got a $2.5 million evaluation report, which you have not have not provided to this Senate. Uh, you had said you would do it uh, before the legislation went through to uh, the House, and you did not. Now, let me go to the uh, ASIC letter, and we are going to dissect this, uh, uh, Minister. You said in your response to my question that you did not agree with my interpretation of this letter. And I think it's important to restate this. It is clear that directing someone's social security payments to the cashless debit card does not fall under the provisions which Senator McCarthy referred to. Well, I would very much like to see the advice that you received from the department on that, because it certainly is not the advice from what ASIC says. The minister has not answered the questions of legality raised by this ASIC advice because you have not done your job properly, as well as the complete lack of independence 
evidence from 13 years of income management in the Northern Territory and years of trials in places like Sejuna and the Kimberley, we now know there are significant questions about the legal operations of this legislation. Perhaps a robo debt too issue right here for this government. Section 12 DL of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act 2001 ASIC Act provides that a person must not send another person a credit card or a debit card except in specified circumstances. These circumstances are, in summary, where the person who will be liable to the issuer of the card in respect of its use has requested the card or in renewal or replacement of or in substitution for a card that has been so requested or previously used for a purpose for which it has intended to be used. These circumstances do not apply to the cashless debit card, which of course is mandatory, not voluntary, and which the government wants to impose on more than 23,000 Territorians. So Labor wrote to ASIC last week asking for their advice on this legislation that will lead to thousands of cards being sent to recipients who have not asked for it. They have not asked for it. That is the key to this response from ASIC. The advice from the Australian Securities Investments Commission about the government's rollout of the cashless debit card shows there are unresolved legal issues with the legislation. In the letter they sent in response to our questions, the ASIC Acting Chair Karen Chester said, if the eligible recipient has not given a written request for the card to be sent to them, there may potentially be a contravention of section 12DL. The letter goes on to say, for the benefit of senators, in 2016, an application was made to ASIC for a no-action letter in relation to the initial trial of the CDC program. A no-action letter granted by ASIC is a statement by ASIC that it does not propose to take action in relation to the contravention or possible contravention identified in the letter in the circumstances set out in the letter. It does not affect the operation of the law itself and does not affect the rights of other persons to take legal action in relation to a contravention of the law. ASIC does not have the power to grant an ex exemption from section 12DL of the ASIC Act. The 2016 no action letter granted by ASIC was specified to apply to the trial of the program. And accordingly, it does not cover the proposed ongoing and broader program to be enabled by the bill. So ASIC advises the issues mainly rest with the sending of the cards, senators. The sending of the cards. And this is a key issue for potential recipients of the card in the Northern Territory and other remote areas. In many cases, they would have to travel hundreds of kilometres to get to the nearest Centrelink office to stand in line and sometimes wait for days to be issued with the grey card. What does this minister and this government expect those people to do? Just have no card? But none of you have any idea of the realities of life for people on welfare. So to get around this issue with Section 12DL for the original trial, in due with the backing of the Department of Social Services, was granted a no-action letter by ASIC. But it is illegal to send these cards. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, actually, to stand here uh, and uh, reply uh, or give, take note of the answers given by Senator Rustin this morning, uh, this afternoon, on the cashless debit card. Uh, it's no secret to, uh, to those in this place that I've been involved uh, with the cashless debit card uh, since before it was even an idea that the government was considering, uh, because I was part of the Mindaroo Foundation. It was an idea that came out of the Forest Review. Uh, based on consultation with uh, people in communities across Australia, uh, and in particular the trial communities that were first initiated through the cashless debit card. Uh, the communities of Sejuna in South Australia and uh, the, the uh, uh, East, uh, East Kimberley uh, in Kununurra and, and in Wyndham. And what we heard from people uh, up there was the need for a circuit breaker to help these communities deal with the, the very devastating effects of chronic alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, and 
People can come into this place, and I've been listening to the debate on this uh, topic today, and they speak of many different things about the card. Uh, and really, when they are here saying, well, the people in these communities actually don't really even know what it is that they're wanting. They, they, they wouldn't actually know what would be good for them. That's essentially what they're coming in here and saying. Well, frankly, that is probably the height of paternalism, the height of paternalism, to say to people in the communities that have the cashless debit card, that actually want the cashless debit card, that called on it in the first place to help them deal with some of the issues. None of them ever thought that it would be the solution to all of their problems. None of them. But what they wanted was a circuit breaker to help them deal with the challenges that they were facing as a community. And this government has been supporting those communities in that endeavour. And it is demonstrating success across the communities. I want to just deal with some facts, some facts, because there hasn't been a lot of facts brought out. There's been a lot of feelings brought out, but not a lot of facts. The cashless debit card is a visa card. It works like any other visa card that any other uh, bank customer would have in Australia, with one exception. That card cannot be used at liquor stores, at pubs, and can't be taken to an ATM to withdraw cash. So it will work at the 900,000 merchants that are signed on as a you know, that have an FPOS machine operating uh, in their retail outlet. It also works online. You can pay your bills online. You can actually buy second-hand furniture because you can use things like PayPal and you can link your card to these sort of services to be able to pay for things. Uh, through COVID, we have seen a dramatic, a dramatic acceleration of the use of uh, contactless payments. And so more and more, Australians are going about their days using contactless payments, using cashless payments all the time. In fact, many people will say that they have uh, cash in their wallet and it's something they don't even go to use anymore because everywhere you go, it used to be such a, a case that it, you know, if you buy a coffee, you almost felt guilty for you know, buying a, a $4, $5 coffee using your card because it was a, an inconvenience to the, to the retailer. But now it's commonly accepted. And so the cashless debit card is operating on the Visa platform, which works just like any other card. It just won't work at a liquor store. But if someone does want to buy alcohol to be able to uh, enjoy a drink uh, uh, for a celebration or with friends uh, over a meal or dinner, they can because there's 20% that's available uh, through a, a, their standard bank account. Lots of feelings are given as evidence across from the other side of this chamber, but not a lot of facts actually are borne out here today. I speak about, often speak about the, the impacts that are happening on the ground and we said, well, they're just anecdotes that are being used. They're just anecdotes that are being used. When you talk to the, 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 the food land in, in South Australia, in Adelaide, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Sejuna, uh, they're now selling more fresh fruit and vegetables and they've actually got less theft happening, less uh, shoplifting happening in their store. Yet those opposites say we can't use that because it's just an anecdote. Well, the anecdotes of people feeling stigmatised, people feeling targeted, are somehow more acceptable than the senior sergeant of police in Kununurra who says that this card is actually having a very positive oh, effect. Sorry, Senator O'Sullivan, your time has expired. Um, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'd just like to take note of Senator Birmingham's answers to my questions and that of Senator Stirl. We're all in this together. How many times? Senator Watt, we are taking note of um, questions by Senator McCarthy and Senator Dodson to Senator Rustin around the cashless debit card and comments that were made on Sky News. That we were also taking note of the questions Senator Stirl and I asked. No, I'm not aware that um, Senator McCarthy said that. There was a fair bit of noise. Um, there was a fair bit of noise in the Senate at the time that she stood up, but I'd like to take note of the answers uh, from uh, senators to Senator McCarthy and Senator Dodson's questions about the cashless debit card. Thank you, Senator Watt. 
The, I've listened very closely to the debate that we've had regarding the cashless debit card over the last couple of days uh, and am more convinced than ever uh, that the government's moves in try, trying to roll out uh, the cashless debit card uh, on a more permanent basis is the wrong move for the individuals concerned in those regions and for the regions in which the cashless debit card uh, will be entrenched if the government gets its way. What Senator McCarthy was highlighting today in her question uh, was that there is serious doubt over the government's capacity to even roll out the cashless debit card, even if it were to get its legislation through this chamber. What the uh, letter from, the, from ASIC shows very clearly uh, is that the government has previously been given dispensation by ASIC to roll out the cashless debit card and to send it to people in a way that would ordinarily breach legislation because, of course, quite rightly, banks and other credit providers are ordinarily prevented from rolling out credit cards willy-nilly to people. So the government has previously been given dispensation to roll out to, to dispatch the cashless debit card uh, in a way that would not normally be permitted, but that was done on a trial basis only. So we don't dispute that the fact that the government has previously had power to send cashless debit cards to individuals in those trial regions. What we dispute is that they continue to have the power to do so on a more permanent basis, because we've seen no evidence whatsoever that the government has received a similar dispensation from ASIC for what it seeks to do into the future. So if the government doesn't have the power to send the cashless debit cards to new participants in the scheme in the regions that are affected, then how does it, how does it actually expect that this is going to work? Because some of the areas in which the cashless debit card has been operating so far and that the government wants to have it uh, continue on a more permanent basis are some of the most remote places in this country. They don't, there, aren't, there aren't shops that people can walk into. There aren't courier services that drop things off in, in the way that in a big city you get something dropped off if you order it on eBay. Well, Senator O'Sullivan, I've actually spent a bit of time in Cape York. I know a little bit about Cape York, for instance. And this may be news to you, this may be news to you, but courier drivers are not in the habit of rolling up to the doors of people on Cape York to drop off a cashless debit card or something that's ordered on eBay or anything else. So there is a real doubt over the government's ability to roll out these debit cards, even if it actually manages to get this legislation through. So I'd ask some of the more sensible voices in this government to actually have a look at the legislation and quickly work out whether they can even do what they want to do. Now, that, of course, leaves aside the issues of whether the cashless debit card is a good idea at all, and I'll have a bit more to say about that in the debate on these bills later today. But the fundamental point to be made, and a number of my colleagues have already done this in this debate, in the, is that there is no evidence whatsoever that backs up what the government is seeking to do. This is an ideologically driven exercise from the government who wants to take away from unemployed people, particularly First Nations people, the capacity to make their own decisions about how they spend their money and instead impose the heavy hand of government in what people can do, which is a very surprising thing for a, for a government that claims to be all about small government to actually want to do, but that is the practical effect of the cashless debit card. It is racially discriminatory because it overwhelmingly applies to First Nations people uh, and it is flawed and without any evidence. The, re the, the research, so-called research that the government has, been, has provided to back up its arguments doesn't stand up to any scrutiny whatsoever and there is a plethora of research which has been published by academic and other experts to show that the cashless debit card does not work. It's not too late for the government to retreat. It should reconsider what it's doing and it should drop this legislation and drop the cashless debit card altogether. Thank you, Senator. What? Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam 
Deputy President, um, and it is a pleasure to rise to take note of the responses given by uh, Minister Rustin in response to questions today. Um, although I regret I may not quite do the topic such justice as my good colleague, Senator O'Sullivan, who I know is incredibly passionate about the cashless debit card. Indeed, he just spoke very passionately um, about it. And um, I know that Senator O'Sullivan has worked extensively in this space, um, both in his career prior to coming to this place and as a senator for Western Australia, um, to ensure that, that we get this policy right. And he and, and many other members of the Morrison Coalition government have been working very carefully and very closely over the last um, 18 or so months to ensure that we get this right. And, and one of the comments that Senator O'Sullivan made in his contribution earlier that I would um, like to, to um, dwell on is that it was these communities that we're talking about that were calling on the government to implement the cashless debit card in, in the first place. And I think that that is something that has perhaps been forgotten in the debate that we've heard uh, in this chamber around the legislation that we will be um, debating later on this afternoon, that it is these communities in these areas that have requested this policy, that have suggested that this policy is a way to solve some of the problems that, that we are seeing in these communities. Senator O'Sullivan used the expression that this cashless debit card could be a circuit breaker, that it would be a circuit breaker to help people in these communities uh, deal with some of the social issues that are causing such great problems um, locally, reducing alcohol uh, and drug consumption, um, reducing gambling, um, th these sorts of things. So I think that this policy um, certainly will uh, go some way to dealing with these issues and, and that can only ever be a good thing. Senator Watt said in his contribution just now, and again, this is something that we are hearing over and over again, that there is no evidence that backs up what the government is trying to do with this policy. And, and I absolutely refute that assertion, Madam Deputy President. Um, fortunately, in the Senate, we have these things called committees that conduct inquiries into legislation. And it is one of the, um, the great joys of my job as a senator that we can come to this place and that we can take legislation that has been passed in the other place, take it to its relevant committee, put that legislation out to the broader Australian community and have a conversation around whether or not what is in the legislation is going to um, to deal with the, the issues that we're trying to rectify here. And indeed, um, the cashless debit card legislation went to the Community Affairs uh, Legislation Committee, chaired by my good friend and fellow Tasmanian Senator Wendy Askew. And that committee uh, has conducted a number of hearings at which evidence has been presented um, that this policy is needed uh, and that this policy will work. And I would like to um, quote from uh, Robin Nolan, the president of the National Council of Women Australia, a great Western Australian like Senator O'Sullivan, who said at the Community Affairs Legislation Committee hearing earlier this month, on the fifth, oh, earlier last month, my apologies, on the fifth of November, um, and Ms. Nolan said, "I've spoken to women and family members in the Kimberley. They are pleased with the card." They can feed their families. Kids aren't going to go to school hungry. And according to those working in the refuge, serious assaults and domestic and family violence reports have declined. Kids who are caught trying to steal food have also declined. So if this is an evidence, Madam Deputy President, that this policy is a good idea and will work and will make lives better um, for, for the people in these communities where the cashless debit card is being rolled out, then I, I don't know what is. Um, and I, I do wonder, uh, Madam Deputy President, whether or not those on the opposition benches have read the report of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, which of course recommended that this legislation uh, should be passed by the Senate. Like I say, this is why we have Senate committees, so they can take legislation to the Australian public, ask them for ideas and feedback, and make a recommendation to this place.
Thank you, Senator Chandy. So the opposition is splitting its time, so I'm going to put that question. So the question is that the um, motion to take note of answers as put by Senator McCarthy be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Sheldon. I move to take note of the answer provided by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Stirl. Well, you know, it's quite clear, they said quite clearly, they will not guarantee individuals won't be worse off. This is the whole strategy by this government. Less pay, less job security. At the very same time, we need to build confidence of the Australian people to be able to spend, to be able to build the economy to make sure the business is successful and are able to employ hard-working Australians. Now, don't, wor don't worry about believing it from me. In 2017, the Reserve Bank said the exact same thing. We have to, and made it very clear, that we have to heed their warning about wages being too low. And of course, what we hear from the government, more of the same. More of the same to turn around and start slashing and burning individuals' rights, individuals' wages and incomes across this country. Now let's look at what they're oversighting right at this moment. Pre-COVID wage stagnation. And now we see the national share of income for the first time in 50 years of wages dropping below 50 per cent. And of course, what's their answer to workers' rights? What's their answer? Because you've got to really look at their history. When it came to casuals being ripped off in the mines, of course, who do they back? The big miners. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Let's cut their rights. Let's the miners double dip against those hard workers, those casual workers who are getting paid up to 40 per cent less than the permanent workers working straight beside them. Of course they intervened. They intervened because they took the side they always did against the Australian public and the Australian working community and back the side of the ruthless companies that turn around and exploit these sorts of workers. Now let's look at another example, Qantas. So they intervene in cases of importance, but comes to Qantas. And I'll quote from Josh Bornstein, who took these people on before during the CQEB dispute, who took the legal action to hold them to account when they conspired using our own armed forces, ex military personnel, to turn around and try to destroy wages in this country. And he said in the, prison, in the Qantas dispute, in a claim that's now been made on behalf of 2,000 hard-working Australians that worked at Qantas, many of whom worked and worked in the, in the electorate of the Prime Minister, no noise from him, not a word of support. And he said, Josh Bornstein, any employee in any sector could suffer the same fate. We need to have a conversation in this country about companies like Qantas profiteering by cannibalising workers' wages. So why doesn't the government intervene for those hard-working Australians? Why doesn't the Prime Minister intervene for his own community? Because they're not well-paid executives of highly paid companies. And of course, what the government set up is another scenario. Their suggestions on IR about what they should be doing about the boot test. Agreements that won't last two years, they'll last way beyond two years. And individual agreements that means people can get paid less, less. And what choice do you have when the boss says to you, guess what, take less or I'll outsource you like Qantas. I'll outsource your jobs to somebody who'll do it if you won't do it. What choice is that? That's choice at a gun. That's economic standover tactics that this government is empowering employers to do. Of course, when they won't intervene in the boot, and of course they won't intervene in matters that are of the interest of hardworking Australians. And I want to just recall a very important comment that was made by Sean, who's a baggage handler, who came to this parliament and sat down in the House of Reps and listened to the Prime Minister. But he had said this in his plea for justice and intervention. I know he's not a big miner, 
He doesn't get the call, doesn't get their ear. He said, I have a wife and three young girls. How can I tell my three girls that you can work hard but can be replaced by a company that will pay people less? Well, this government's actually enshrining it. This government is getting rid of the boot Order, test, which Senator says that people Sheldon, will be worse um, off. The question is the motion moved by Senator Sheldon be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Country no, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answer of the Leader of the Government in the Senate regarding the Christchurch mosque murders. This was a terrorist attack committed by an Australian man who, the report says, was driven by an extreme right wing Islamophobic ideology. Any denial or obfuscation of this simple fact is an insult to the targets. I cried as I read the report yesterday. I cried for the innocent Muslims who were brutally murdered by the terrorists. I cried for the survivors who lost their loved ones forever, overwhelmed by the courage of the community who had been through so much. And I cried as I read the greeting, Assalamu Alaikum, at the start of the report, and words like Masjideh and Shohada sprinkled through the report, words that resonate with the Muslim community words that show empathy and respect for them. The report's findings and recommendations should be taken with utmost seriousness in Australia, where the terrorist has lived for most of his life. There are lessons here for the way we approach the many intersecting issues. I urge the Prime Minister to engage with the Australian Muslim community and carefully interrogate what needs to change in Australia. The report confirms the terrorist engaged with known far-right and white supremacist groups in Australia, some of which remain active in various forms. Two of these groups forced me to cancel an anti-racism event in Newcastle last year due to their planned disruption. Far-right extremism is not only still present in this country, it is growing. Just in the last few minutes, we have found out that an 18-year-old man from New South Wales has been arrested today. He had been accessing extreme right-wing material online, including how to make bombs. He was supportive of the Christchurch mosque massacre and openly racist. If this isn't a wake-up call, I don't know what will be. This country is in complete denial of these problems that we face. Let's be clear that there is no way in hell that we are going to be able to properly combat the racism in our culture in our country without acknowledging there are clear and ongoing links between the toxic far right and elements of our mainstream media and parliamentary politics. To take one example, it was revealed in the report that the terrorists made donations to numerous media organizations affiliated with people who are in our media class and given platform by Australian media outlets. In 2017, the terrorists made donations to media organizations run by or linked to two individuals, Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux, who came to Australia in mid-2018 on a speaking tour and participated in many sympathetic interviews with the right-wing media, in particular Sky News. Later in 2018, Senator Hansen moved in this very chamber her infamous motion claiming that it's okay to be white. As was noted back then, the slogan has a history of use in far-right and white supremacist circles. But it shot to attention in Australia by being worn on a t-shirt by Lauren Southern as she touched down here in 2018. She is now a regular Sky News contributor and lives in Australia. We can grow used to it after years of frustration, but hearing some of the contributions in this place today and earlier, there is an absurd amount of racist drivel that is spouted without sanction or accountability. There are people in this chamber who are not called out for their racism and bigotry, but those of us who highlight it are quickly called to order. With this attitude prevailing in our national parliament, we have little hope of tackling racism. I've said this before, and I will say it again. Australia is yet to reckon with being the country that raised the Christchurch killer. The government must take responsibility for the rise in far-right extremism reported by ASIO. All of the report's recommendations should be taken seriously and considered in Australia. We should have strong hate speech laws and dedicate resources to tracking hate crimes properly. 
I also welcome the report's recommendation to dedicate more government resources to challenging racism and promoting equality. Australia needs a national anti-racism campaign to combat and eradicate prejudice and bias. There is much to consider over the coming months, days and weeks. My thoughts are with the survivors and the families of those targeted as they process the release of this disturbing report. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary no, the ayes have it. Senator Burnley.